Welcome back to the West Block. Well, many questions have been raised in the wake of last week's news from the Senate, not the least of which is the future of the Senate itself. Well, joining me now, Paul Wells of McLean's Magazine and from Post Media, Steve Marr. Welcome to you both. Let me start with this. How badly does any of this hurt Stephen Harper? Steve? Uh, this is a, a government that's starting to show its age, I think. We're, you know, six years in, uh, and uh, messes are starting to accumulate. The Senate looks like a mess, and it looks like Stephen Harper's mess. He's responsible for the institution as it is now. He said he'd reform it. He was elected in 2006. He just now gets around to sending a referral to the Supreme Court. He appointed these people, uh, most spectacularly Senator Brazo. So it is sticking to him, and, and there's no way around that. Paul? I'm, I'm not sure people vote on whether or not the Senate is a mess. If they did, every government since 1867 would have fallen at the first hurdle. But uh, what we're seeing is, is, is the shortcoming of Harper's incrementalist approach. He likes, to, he likes to go at every issue from a viewpoint of, can I peck away a chunk of it today and then leave it for a while and come back tomorrow? You can't do that with the Senate. It's a Gordian knot. And you either uh, throw all the resources of government at, um, at reforming it, as Mulroney did in 1992 and failed, or you leave it alone. And I think right now he's wishing he'd left it alone from the beginning. But I'm wondering, though, whether we have reached critical mass uh, in terms of public opinion on this. I think most times Canadians shrug their shoulders when it comes to the Senate, no matter what they're up to. But this concentration of senators misbehaving, uh, do you feel that that's really sort of pushed the agenda, though, more towards the idea of reform or abolition? The Canadians are finally saying, look, this, let's just get rid of this stupid thing or at least reform it. And to Van Loan, when I was talking to Peter Van Loan, he, he said, well, I don't want to use time allocation to push this through because it's so, uh, so important. I mean, the two seem to be at odds with one another. Well, Mr. Harper really can't either abolish it or reform it, I don't think, not without a huge effort that might not succeed, as Paul says. Uh, so it's a it's a, an ongoing problem that they've got to manage. And it reminds me a little bit when I was first working on the Hill, Dave Dingwall was in trouble for his expenses and he coined the phrase, I'm entitled to my entitlements. These kind of things can be very toxic for a governing party because taxpayers and voters looking on are saying, well, that doesn't seem right that he's claiming, that Senator Duffy is claiming a, a living allowance for his primary residence and it's in Ottawa. So you set up these tensions within the government because they have to, they want to be, help out their, their friends in, in office, but the, they also have to account to the public for how they're spending the money. So it's awkward for them. It's, it's possible for people to be in favor of reform and to never, ever be able to agree on a reform proposal. During the 17 months that he was prime minister, every once in a while, Paul Martin would face this question. Why don't you make the Senate more representative? And he used to say, well, as soon as the provinces agree on a plan, we'll be happy to look at it. Because he knew that in a thousand years, they would never agree on a plan. Alberta and British Columbia, because of the number of senators they have now, their interests are diametrically opposed when it comes to serious Senate reform. And so, and, and, and Stephen Harper knows that better than anyone. I was struck, Burt Brown, the senator who plowed Triple E Senate or else into his uh, field, cornfield, uh, umpty dump years ago, and is now one of the few elected senators in the Senate, uh, announced to a newspaper reporter uh, some details of Harper's plan for Senate reform and was shot down an hour later by the Prime Minister's office and said, no, that's not the Prime Minister's plan. If Burt Brown doesn't know what Stephen Harper's plan is, that's your first hint that there isn't one. Right. I want to go to one other issue that, that sort of got knocked off the pages uh, this week because of what happened in the Senate, and that was the robocalls in Saskatchewan. Uh, it had to do with redrawing district boundaries, but uh, what made it newsworthy, I guess, was that the Conservatives first said, no, no, we didn't make those calls. And then a few days later they went, well, actually, we did make those calls. And then a senior member, Tom Lukiski, who's the deputy, the parliamentary secretary to the House leader, says, well, it was all Jenny Byrne, who happens to be the campaign manager and as close to Stephen Harper as you can get. I mean, if the Senate hadn't happened, this would have been a big story. But, Paul, what do you make of that? Incidentally, I think some of Steve's uh, reporting uh, encouraged the Conservatives to change their story. When, I was uh, going to get to that. When he and his colleague <laughs> found a forensic voice analyst to say that the voice on those calls is awfully familiar. Um, and then the Conservatives' um, memory improved rapidly in the hour or two after that. Um, uh, I'm not sure what to make of this it, 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 uh, Likiski thing, that it's, it's Jenny Byrne's responsibility. Um, he seemed to have been making essentially a flowchart argument, that the person in charge of party operations is Jenny Byrne, the director of the party, and therefore she is 
responsible. Strictly speaking, that isn't even, that, that's not quite the, the, the ultimate truth. The ultimate truth is that the leader of the party is responsible. His name is Harper. Um, I, uh, Steve will know better than I how much uh, trouble they're in right now, and maybe we should ask him. Absolutely. And better to be complimented from the outside than have to do it yourself. <laughs> but congratulations. Well, the, the compliments likely are go to my friend and colleague, uh, Glenn McGregor, who heard the voice message and said, that sounds like the same guy, Matt Meyer, who we remember from the Pierre Poutine call. And one of the things that strikes me about this is that at, at the time when the original robocall controversy broke, and it, obviously people, someone connected with the Conservative Party appears to have done, deliberately tried to confuse people about where they should vote. The extent of it is still somewhat something of a mystery, but there's hundreds of thousands of dollars, a lot of human suffering in investigating this. You would think that the Conservative Party and Mr. Harper and Jenny Byrne would have said nothing more that's even a little bit questionable. Here's our policy book. We are not going to break CRTC rules. We're not going to break the Election Act. We're going to do everything by the book. And in Saskatchewan, they did not do that. They did a deceptive push-pull, and then they did not seem to know that they had done it until we found a voice analyst who said that they had. So it's a, it's a little bit surprising. I've got to stop you there because I want to leave some time to say that if you haven't read Deadline, which is Steve Marr's e-book, terrific read, and Paul Wells, you've got a book coming out in November and an announcement to be made right here on the West Block. Well, yeah, I'm writing a book about Stephen Harper, and it's going to be on the newsstands in November, about the same time his hockey book is on newsstands. So they make an excellent uh, pair of purchases for Christmas. Um, the <laughs> title, title, of the title of the book is going to be The Longer I'm Prime Minister, Stephen Harper and Canada, 2006 to dot, dot, dot. Paul Wells coming out in November. Thank you both very much for being here. Steve Marr, Paul Wells.